Hello ladies and gentlemen of the internet and welcome back to what is part 4 of our series on Shinto mythology. If you haven't seen parts 1 through 3 as well as our character study on Amaterasu, be sure to check those out in the playlist listed in the description first. So when we left off, Susano killed a snake, gave his sister the sword he stole from its tail, married Kusanada, upgraded his father-in-law from funny footman to funny butler man, and now we're here, taking a quick aside from the Amaterasu Yamato centric story which will eventually lead us into the Japanese emperors, and for now we are going to focus on the Izumo Cycle, a series of stories focusing on the lineage of Susano. It's important for later on down the line, plus it's just about as weird as the rest of the Kojiki thus far, which of course means good content. So, after Susano disgraces the foot-rubbing deity by relegating him to being his personal butler, he takes his, probably, underage wife and puts a baby into her right in front of him. And no, I'm not kidding either. Read the passage. There is no in-between to these events. Susano just likes to take a piss on this guy and tell him that it's raining. Anyway, this firstborn son is called Yashimaji Numi. And aside from being the spawn of a literal god, he is otherwise irrelevant. Just like his boy. And his boy. And his boy. And his boy. And that tiny penis man on a motorcycle who decided to rev his engine right in front of my window. And his boy. And... Oh shit, wait, this is actually our main character. So here at the 14th generation of Kami, who aren't even really gods anymore, we have Opo Kuni Nushi no Kami, also named Opo Namudi no Kami, also named Asipara Siko wo no Kami, also named Yati Poko no Kami, also named Utusi Kuni Tama no Kami. You may think that I am fucking with you, but this is literally in the book. All of these names have way too many hyphens and accented vowels for my taste, so for the purposes of this video, let's just call him Oku Ninushi. Or just Oku. Or you can preemptively refer to him as Dumbass. You'll see why by the end of this video. Now, Oku Ninushi's dad must have been the world's first hentai protagonist, as poor Oku here was one of 80 similarly aged brothers. Not wanting to be outdone by dear old dad, every single one of these brothers had the same intention, to travel out to the land of Inaba and attempt to woo the beautiful princess Yagami Hime. Evidently, Oku Nanushi was the youngest and most easily exploited of his brothers, as when they packed up for the trip, they made Oku carry all of their luggage for them, causing him to lag behind. Which evidently isn't a very big deal, as they all just keep on walking ahead, abandoning him with all of their stuff in the middle of the wilderness. I guess one of Oku's nicknames, among many others, was Footy Jr. So while Oku was still trying to get out the door, his older brothers had already made their way to, into the woods. Whereupon, they came across a furless rabbit lying out beside the beaten path. The brothers, being the group of massive douchebags that they were, told the rabbit that if he wanted to get his fur back, he should bathe in the salt waters of the ocean, then rest atop the highest peak of the mountain, and let the winds blow on his bare skin. Doing as the brothers said, the rabbit took a swim and then sat atop the highest mountain where the salt in his skin, coupled with the dry winds, caused his already leathery skin to crack apart like the bottom of a diabetic's foot who has already had multiple toes amputated, causing the rabbit horrible pain. By the time the rabbit came back down to the pathway through the forest, the elder brothers had already moved on, but he was just in time to meet with Oku, who, being the routine subject of such treatment by his brothers, took pity on the small animal and offered him the real solution to his problems, which apparently was to go bathe in a nearby river, then roll around in the pollen of the Kama grass, though some say it was the seeds of a cattail plant. Somehow this works and the white rabbit of Inaba regains its fur. The rabbit thanks Oku and tells him of how he got himself into this situation in the first place. So originally, the rabbit was from the island of Oki, yet wanted to cross over into Honshu, and so devised a clever little scheme where he would call upon the sharks, 
Some translations say it was crocodiles, but that's bullshit. Crocodiles don't live in the ocean. And told them that if they all lined up in a row, nose to fin, he would run across their backs and count how many there were. Apparently the purpose behind this was so that the rabbit could tell the sharks whether there were more of his kind or theirs. Which I guess is important information for the sharks to know because, um... Uh... Oh, I know, it's because this is the Kojiki and you should know better than to ask questions by now. So anyway, the sharks do as the rabbit requested, lining up to form a bridge of highly marketable VTubers all the way to Honshu. However, either due to hubris or dumbassetry, as the hare was about to cross the final shark, he starts taunting them, telling them that it was all a sham and that he had fooled them into doing exactly as he had wanted. The last shark in the chain, not taking too kindly to this revelation, jumps up just as the rabbit was about to reach dry land and rips his skin off with her teeth, leaving the hare in the sad, disheveled state where Oku's brothers found him. As repentance for showing him some kindness, the rabbit tells Oku Nanushi that his brothers are a bunch of cucks and he'll use his divine influence – rabbits and hares are sacred to the Japanese – to convince Yagami Hime to marry him instead. Some later iterations of the myth attest that this rabbit was actually the deity Sukuna Bikona, who appears later on in the Iizumo cycle, and who we will be covering a bit more extensively in part 5. Even though I really wish that we didn't have to. After showing up late to Inaba, Oku discovers that the princess had already turned down every single one of his brothers. However, seeing the strong, burly hunk of man carrying all 80 of his brother's luggage on his back, Yagami Hime decided pretty much instantly that she wanted to fuck that guy. And so she did. And they lived happily ever after. Oh. But seriously, were you guys expecting anything different? Overcome with jealousy, the brothers of Oku plotted to kill him. And no, that was just for dramatic effect. They didn't just shoot him with an arrow. This is Japan we're talking about. The plan has to be at least a hundred times more ridiculous and convoluted. So the brothers told him that they were going to hunt a boar up in the mountains, and they needed him to wait at the bottom of the mountain to make sure it didn't get away, advising him not to run away from it, as running will ensure that the beast will surely gore him to death. As opposed to just, you know, standing there and getting gored to death. This next part is so fucking hilarious and ridiculous, but I need you guys to trust me that I did not embellish any of this. This is all literally in the Kojiki. So the brothers find a boar-shaped boulder up in the mountains, then set it on fire and roll it down the side of the mountain towards Oku, who somehow mistakes this giant, flaming, multi-ton rock of death for a boar and attempts to catch it with his bare hands, whereupon he is instantly incinerated. <laughs> Do you know how many conveniences this plan required in order for it to work? Fuck it, I'm counting this flaming boar rock as a BSMPD because apparently it has the power to make Oku's IQ dip into the negative. Amazed and saddened by the fact that her son had died such a dumbass, Oku's mother prayed to Kami Mimusubi, one of the three gods of the first generation of Kami for those who can't remember, to restore her son to life so that she wouldn't have to put crushed to death while trying to catch a flaming boar boulder on his death certificate. Agreeing that it was pretty fucking funny, Kami Mimusubi agreed to and sent the Ark Shell Princess and the Clam Princess, uh, okay, to go in JC Okuninushi's ass and give him a second chance at life. This time making the most of it, getting back the girl and living happily ever after. Ah, oh, come on, man. Nope, they kill him again. And this time, the plan is even more ridiculous. So his brothers take him out to the mountains, again, and start cutting down a big-ass tree, leaving behind a sizable wedge in its trunk, which they then coax Oku to climb into for no reason at all, and then push the tree over, crushing him to death within the wedge of the trunk. Uh, 
Oku, you know, no, 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 you know what? Fuck you. I was memeing earlier when I called you Footy Jr., but that's his name now. I refuse to acknowledge him as anything else from now on. Footy Jr.'s mom comes to the rescue again, taking the red, gooey paste of what had been her son out of the tree, and evidently this time she didn't need any divine intervention to help revive her son, which is... okay, I guess. Once he is revived, she tells him, Look, you can't trust your brothers, get the fuck out of Dodge while you still can, and do not stop for anyone. You got that, you little retard? This time, Footy Jr. wises up and takes his mother's advice, fleeing from Inaba with his brothers hot on his trail. Ironically, this time they actually do just try and do the sensible thing and shoot him with their arrows, but they miss and Footy Jr. escapes into the wilderness, setting his sights on Suga and the Palace of Susano for protection. And I've had just about enough of this shit for one day. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. Part 5 is going to be coming up next month. Be looking forward to that. Huge thanks to my Patreon names right over here for sponsoring this video. $5 a month gets you access to my Patreon-exclusive series Academic Ayakashi Archive, as well as some other cool shit. So if you want to head over there and help fund me and my future projects, I'd be very appreciative. Don't forget that we also have a Discord where you can hang out and chat about various mythologies. And if any of you are new here or were drawn in by Gura in the thumbnail, why not subscribe if you found today's video entertaining slash informative. Slash both. Slash something else. I, 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 don't, I don't really know what kind of emotions these things invoke in people. Liking the video and leaving a comment also really helps out the channel more than you realize, so if you guys want to go ahead and do that, even if it's just to call me a dumbass, I'd really appreciate it. Until next time, folks, my name is Messiah's a Mytholo-